I'm really honored and humbled to be part of this year's Class of Talented 12 recipients and excited to have the opportunity to tell you a little bit more about how we're trying to accelerate early discovery research through advancements to DNA encoded library chemistry. First, a little bit about me. I grew up in St. Albans, Vermont, which is a small town in the northwestern corner of Vermont, just south of the Canadian border. And we're really proud of our maple syrup, so if you ever get a chance to have pure Vermont maple syrup, I'd highly recommend it. Um, I'm the daughter to a chemistry major and an English major and sister to an artist. I would say growing up, my parents didn't really force me into one, any one area of study, but really encouraged me to pursue a liberal arts education uh, in college. And with that in mind, and given my desire to play softball further in college, I went to St. Mike's just down the road. Um, I'm really glad my parents recommended a liberal arts education. My job as a chemist requires way more oral and written communication skills and way more creativity than you know, the science and math obsessed teenager in me ever thought. So I'm really grateful to them for that. Uh, while at St. Mike's, I did three summers of undergrad research, one actually in physical chemistry at St. Mike's and then two in organic chemistry, one at the University of Yukon as part of an REU program and then one at the University of Utah, again, an REU program. And it was during this process that I realized I wanted to go on uh, and work in the pharmaceutical industry, and so I pursued my PhD at Yale University, where I worked in the lab of Andrew Phillips. And while there, I initially started working on the total synthesis of natural products, and in particular focusing on thylandamide A. It's a cryptic polyketide natural product that's produced by Burkholderia thailandensis that we believe was poised to undergo an intramolecular Diels-Alder rearrangement as part of a potential signaling cascade for the bacteria. Midway through my graduate career though, Andy moved our lab to the Broad Institute and we had to leave all of our projects behind. And so I then switched over into the area of DNA encoded library technology in the pursuit of a novel inhibitor for CBX7. Um, and so as part of this process, I made, screened, and analyzed the Broad's first non-templated DNA encoded library. And as part of this, I went to a conference around Dell technology and met a number of my now colleagues. And so when I heard they had an opportunity in their encoded library technology chemistry group, I really jumped at the opportunity and I've been there ever since. Um, I now lead a team of a handful of chemists that are focused on really increasing the diversity and developability of our small molecule screening hits uh, that our colleagues in pharma use. For those that may not have heard about DNA encoded libraries, the idea was actually first proposed back in 1992 by a pair of molecular biologists, Sidney Brenner and Richard Lerner. They hypothesized that we should be able to make libraries of small molecules that are covalently encoded by unique DNA sequences in a manner analogous to the phage display libraries they had experience with. By linking our small molecule phenotype with our DNA genotype, this would allow us to pool everything together and subject our collection to affinity selection as a single mixture of compounds. And then by using powerful molecular biology techniques of PCR amplification and high throughput sequencing, we could identify which small molecule bound to our target of interest. It's taken pharma a while to actually get this into practice, but in doing so, what it's allowed us to do is transition from a model where we have to make and individually screen millions of molecules for our corporate screening collection and this requires large laboratories with robotics and it takes months to kind of annotate our collections to now being able to house and screen millions to billions to even trillions of molecules for drug discovery in a single tube and this can be easily manipulated by a single chemist or a single biologist. We make our libraries through what's called split and pool chemistry and we begin with a bifunctional molecule that we call our headpiece. At one end it has an amine handle for building up our small molecule and at the other double-stranded DNA with a two base pair overhang to attach the growing DNA chain. This material gets split out for the first cycle of chemistry and we typically operate in 96 well plates. To each well gets added a unique DNA tag that we enzymatically ligate onto the starting material so we now have a unique DNA sequence in each well of our plate. We can then add in a unique building block to each well and attach this through a variety of different chemical reactions of choice. I will pause and say because we're running reactions on DNA, um, we have to be working on water, on the benchtop, open to air. Um, so this poses certainly a, a challenge in developing new chemistry that's 
compatible with our library synthesis. And we're also often working on the 10 nanomole scale. Once we've covalently attached our small molecule to our DNA, we can pool everything together into a single vessel without any loss of information and then subject this pooled material to any global deprotection and purification steps that are needed. And from here, this pooled material can then be split out into a second 96 well plate for the next cycle of chemistry. And you can imagine through the power of combinatorial synthesis, if you repeat this for three different cycles of chemistry, each with 96 building blocks at each cycle, you can quite rapidly make a library of almost 900,000 molecules, each with their own unique DNA tag. And you can imagine if you're, say, a pharmaceutical industry, and instead of 96 building blocks, you have access to thousands or tens of thousands, you can really quickly make up libraries of billions or trillions of molecules. At GSK, we have over 100 DNA encoded libraries in our collection in active use. We screen these against protein targets that our program teams bring to us that they're interested in for drug discovery efforts. We require that our protein come affixed with affinity tags, which allows us to capture them onto an immobilized solid support. We first verify that the protein is able to maintain activity, often through testing against a known tool compound, before then subjecting our protein to our collection of libraries in an affinity selection protocol. The selection process, essentially we co-mix the target of interest with our library. We capture anything that binds to the target, wash away anything that doesn't, and then elute anything that's bound often through heat denaturation of the protein or addition of a competitive inhibitor. The released DNA then undergoes PCR amplification and sequencing, which allows us to translate the DNA tags from what has bound to the corresponding, essentially synthetic recipes um, what was the steps that were taken with which building blocks that led to the products that actually bound to your target. We analyze the data then and evaluate which compounds we want to make off DNA to confirm binding and activity and subject this material to either biophysical or biochemical screens. And this provides us with our qualified hits for lead gen efforts or tool compounds for target validation. We're leveraging this technology to really accelerate the early discovery process within the pharmaceutical industry, and we're doing this in a couple ways. The first is that we're using our libraries in early tractability assessments to help program teams prioritize which targets they go after for screening in an effort to identify the candidates most likely to be small molecule tractable. We're also leveraging this in lead discovery efforts where the combinatorial synthesis that we use to make our libraries really accelerates our compound collection expansion efforts into unexplored areas. In addition, the fact that our selections can be done in a matter of days or a week, this really reduces our timelines um, to go from target to hit ID um, from you know, many months to now a much shorter time frame. And then finally, because we're able to build in quite extensive depth of SAR into our libraries, this can lead to fewer changes that's actually needed to achieve candidate selection. And we've seen this play out in our case um, of RIP1 kinase, where it took just a two atom change, highlighted in the ring here, to go from the exemplar ELT hit to the clinical candidate and took fewer than three years to um, actually get the candidate selected molecule. And this molecule is now in phase two clinical trials against a number of different disease indications. Moving forward, my goal as a Dell chemist is to provide program teams with more superior novel chemical hits for drug discovery. And we envision doing this in a couple ways. The first is that we wanna make more libraries and desired chemical space to really expand the diversity of our compound collection. And the second is that we wanna shift our library distribution so that more compounds exist within desirable space to make sure that everything that we make can be developable and really move quickly through our pipeline. In practice, how we're doing this is we're expanding our collection of building blocks and scaffolds that are amenable to DNA and code library synthesis, and are expanding the Dell Reaction Toolkit so that new disconnections are possible using our existing building block sets. One area we focused on is expanding our reaction toolkit to moving beyond CSP2, CSP2 couplings. If you look at the progression from uh, more flat 2D molecules to now molecules that have greater 3D complexity, you see a corresponding increase in the binding affinity, solubility, and specificity of those molecules. And if you look at the progression of compounds from early discovery into the clinic and then those that have been approved as known drugs, 
we see an increased fraction of CSP3 content is correlated with increased drug viability. And so given we want our molecules to quickly progress through this pipeline, this seems like a goal that we should look to achieve. And I've highlighted on the right a few GSK drugs that have high SP3 content, as well as a handful of disconnections in orange that we'd like to be able to make in our libraries moving forward. In pursuit of this, we initiated a collaboration with Gary Molander's lab at the University of Pennsylvania to develop new photoredox-enabled CSP3 couplings um, in an effort to increase the SP3 content of our libraries. In particular, we worked with a really talented postdoc in James Phelan to establish our first set of on-DNA photoredox-mediated transformations. The first reaction that we went after took on-DNA aryl halides, uh, aryl bromides and aryl iodides, and coupled them with aliphatic amino acids and dihydropyridines, which come from aldehyde feedstocks as our radical precursors. And this allows us to generate CSP2, CSP3 cross-couplings as an alternative to the commonly used Suzuki reaction in medicinal chemistry. The other reaction we looked to implement was the alkylation of this trifluoromethyl alkene with acids, dihydropyridines, and silicates as our radical precursors to give us the alkylated gem difluoroalkene which has been proposed to be a more metabolically stable ketone mimetic and is quite different from anything we've seen currently in our collection. Importantly, these reactions were all run on the benchtop exposed to air and in water and could be done in as little as uh, 10 minutes in the bottom reaction through application of blue LEDs. As we look to the future of this technology, I think we're really excited to continue our collaboration with Gary's lab but there are a number of other areas of reaction development that I think will play out and be important as we move forward. And the first is reactions with alcohols, um, as well as enanti or diastereoselective transformations and cross-couplings. Um, we're working on enzymatic biocatalysis, and uh, we're already starting to see some chemistry pop up around CH activation and electrochemistry. And finally, we're also looking to enable cheminformatics and AI ML-based uh, design and process acceleration efforts. Uh, so we're looking to implement this in a number of different ways, the first being selecting the building blocks that go into our reactions more smartly, the second being identifying which building blocks we should use in our libraries to give us the best balance of diversity and developability, and finally, better understanding the chemical space our libraries cover so that we can better identify uh, what our gaps are and where we should move to next. So with that, um, I'd like to thank everyone at CNE News and Thermo Fisher for this uh, really great honor, and also like to thank my family and friends and fiance for their love and support over the years. Finally, I get to work with a really talented group of folks at GSK, um, including Lisa Markerell, who leads our ELT chemistry group, and internal collaborators in Andy Pete in our medicines design group, and finally, the folks at, in Gary's lab at UPenn, including James Phelan, the postdoc I mentioned earlier, who we've since hired into GSK, and Sharuk Badir, who's since taken the torch from him as we continue our collaboration. Um, and finally, I'd like to, to thank my former boss, Chris Davey, who hired me into the ELT chemistry group. Unfortunately, he lost his battle with brain cancer earlier this year um, and didn't get to see the results of our photoredox collaboration, but I think he'd be really proud of the work that we've done and excited to see where the field moves to next. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions.